Have you seen me dice bag? <laughs> Rognard Files. Hello, my name is Dirt the Dice. This is the Grognard Files podcast, talking bobbins about tabletop RPGs from back in the day. I'm coming live from my den under the stairs here at Dirk Towers in Bolton, UK. I'm surrounded by my stuff. If I spin my chair to the left, there's my collection of Moff Tarkin figures, my favourite evil bureaucrat. To the right is the Great Library of Tabletop RPG and my Grognard files. In front of me is my steam-powered equipment to bring you this in super high fidelity. Behind me If I roll too far back, I'll knock over the hoover. This is the first episode of The Grognard Files, where I'll reach over to my shelf and pull down a file and discuss a feature game, the memories, the history, to transport you back to a golden age, back to the early 80s, a mystical time when the summers were long and time was in plentiful supply. This podcast is brought to you by the Armchair Adventurers Club, Me, Blythe and Eddie. We played together all those years ago, up to 19 hours a day, every day. Starting with a session in the morning, perhaps rolling new characters, breaking for beans on toast, with an angel delight for afters if we were lucky, running running again through a tough adventure in the afternoon, breaking for potato hash with pickled red cabbage, before coming back for more. When we weren't playing, we were preparing, And when we weren't preparing, we were running a postal game with players from all over the country. In this podcast, we will share some of the memories from this halcyon time. After a break of 20-odd years, the Armchair Adventures Club came back together to play again. At first it was with a sense of nostalgia, but before long, the latent addiction took hold once more. It's very different now. Back then, our parents were happy to leave us to our own devices. We may have been consorting with the devil in our bedrooms, but at least we weren't on the corners sniffing glue. Nowadays, with children of our own and other responsibilities, we have to find stolen moments, getting together now and again to meet face-to-face or online. How will this podcast work? Well, each episode will have a featured game, where we'll look in depth of our memories of playing and some of the supplements of the game. I'll just reach over to the shelf and pull down the first file. It's RuneQuest. It was one of the first role-playing games, first published in 1979, written by Steve Perrin and Ray Turney with others, and set in Greg Stafford's wonderfully realised fantasy world of Glorantha. Stafford's company, Chaosium, published the game, and the second edition was published in the early 80s under licence by Games Workshop. Characters are not limited to a class. It's a percentile-based system where you roll on a D100 to determine success against a range of skills. Combat skills of attack and parry are determined in the same way. Fighting is fun, slick, tactical, cinematic and very deadly. You can spot a player schooled in request. They're the one urging everyone not to be so hasty when the rest of the party are ready to rush in. All characters have access to magic in its different forms. Battle magic is simple cantrips that usually help in tricky situations. Rune magic is more powerful, but only attainable as characters progress through their cult. There's also a shamanistic relationship to spirits and elementals. A character's magical ability is measured by their power. The higher the power, the more closely they have a magical presence of their god. Glorantha is a polytheistic ancient world setting with living gods. Most adventures are set in Dragon Pass, where barbarian clans are resisting the relentless march of the Lunar Empire, or in the neighbouring plains of Prax, a vast steppe region inhabited by tribes of beast riders, bison riders, zebra riders, etc., 
The world has its own distinct ecology with great fantastical monsters such as elder races, such as trolls, who appear in different forms. Dark trolls, mistress race trolls and cursed trollkin. Aldromai, a form of sentient plant life, appear as elves, dryads, pixies and the mustali of dwarves. But it's the creatures of chaos where Glorantha really comes into his own, such as the disease-ridden brews, the original chaos hybrids. If you want to know about the origin of Glorantha and the story of the different editions of RuneQuest, then look out for an extra micro grod pod coming soon. But for now, this is about the second edition. Section 1. Open Box In this section, I'll reopen the box that we first played with and talk about how we got started. Section 2. The White Dwarf to fully understand the UK grognard experience, you need to have White Dwarf. Everything comes back to White Dwarf, and we're delighted that we have a special contribution from at Daily Dwarf himself. He's from the Twitterverse, no less, where he's been tweeting samples from the heyday of White Dwarf. He's provided his favourite RuneQuest feature from the magazine for this podcast. Section 3, Judge Ru- Judge Blythe rules. I'll be joined later by Blythe, our resident rules lawyer. He'll talk about some of the key rules mechanics of RuneQuest. Section 4, the Games Master's Screen. Five essential RuneQuest supplements. And Daddy, the armchair adventuring bargain hunter, will give a buyer's guide on how to get hold of the supplements so you can recreate the grognard experience with your own pocket money. Section 5, there is no Section 5, but I'll say goodbye and let you know about what's coming up in future episodes. But for now, it's RuneQuest, and RuneQuest is the game that first introduced us to the hobby, and the one that we've played the most of since we got back together. It's such an important game to us that we'll probably come back to it again. This episode will focus on the second edition rules, but in recent months we've been learning the rather wonderful design mechanism revamp RuneQuest 6. But without any further ado, ramblers, let's get rambling. Section 1, open box. Unlike many others of our generation, we were introduced to RPGs by an after school club or some older boys. No, we stumbled upon it like strangers in a strange land, trying to make sense of the games by reading the rules. Back in 1981, before discovering role-playing games, we played no more, no less actual games than any other child. We joined the chess club. We dabbled in playing Pac-Man at the computer club in the school's only computer, which was held in such awe by the school that it might as well have been christened Hal. It was kept in a locked room and rolled out on a trolley, We would eagerly wait for our turn, surprising really when you consider that all it did was run Pac-Man and occasionally go ping. Not quite Rise of the Machines yet. We also played one or two board games we bought from the shelves of the local toy shop. Boydell Toys was a special place in Bolton Town Centre. Its original location was in a tight, confined space where the stock was piled high to create an eye-popping cornucopia of toys, games, model aircraft and cuddly toys. There were only a handful of locations that were important to us when we were 11 and 12. Our houses, our nan's houses, school and Boydell Toys. Boydell's had a game section, of course, as any toy shop would with Monopoly, Cluedo, the usual stuff. But to the side of these ordinary games was a few shelves of unusual boxes, games and books with brightly coloured pictures of spaceships, battles from history and warriors straight out of the legends of King Arthur. Unknown to us, we'd already put a foot in the role-playing door because near the rack of diligently ordered umbro colour paint pots there was a new rack propped precariously against the wall. It alerted our curiosity immediately because it was displaying small plastic bags stapled with a cardboard label describing the contents. Each bag contained a lead figure 
with incredibly evocative descriptions. Advancing Fire Salamander, Hobgoblin with Halbard, Pixie with Wand, etc. There was a price code on the label too, and a nearly discernible logo for a mysterious Citadel Miniatures. We started to buy a couple every week, building up a small collection. A little later, a new series of box figures came uh, out, and they were RuneQuest figures, packed with colourful characters and brilliantly sculpted minis, wearing ancient Greek armour with great names such as Darker Fall Adventurer, Yaumelio Adventurer, Orlanth Adventurer, Azorak Zoran Troll Adventure, with a huge maul, a Morakanth Adventurer, a Duck Adventurer, complete with a cute little sword and everything. We wanted to be those adventurers, maybe not so much the Duck, but to become a Stormbull Adventurer with a thick beard and a horned helmet so we could face the bad guys, the Jackalbear, the Bruise, the dragon newts riding large demi-birds, the scorpion men. At the time, we hadn't made the connection with these figures and the role-playing games, but thanks to the RuneQuest figures, we were made able to make the jump. Games Workshop had already established itself in the UK as an importer of American RPGs by having the exclusive rights for the import of Dungeons & Dragons. In the early 80s, they had a few shops in major cities, White Dwarf, the house magazine, which had a growing readership, and Citadel Miniatures, which was a sister company. It was producing some brilliantly sculpted lead figures. They'd lost their exclusivity to the distribution of D&D, so put their weight behind repackaging and promoting RuneQuest as the fantasy game within their portfolio. The Games Workshop box set contained everything you needed to play, which at the time seemed like slim pickings, but on reflection, it was a feast. They were all packed together in a sturdy box that went fft when it closed. I've got mine in front of me here. It's not the original set, and that ended up in landfill years ago. This one I got on eBay 13 years ago for the princely sum of seven of your English pounds. A bit less than what I actually paid for the original way back in 81. It's in pristine condition too. If I wanted a like-for-like -like replacement in 2015, it would set me back about 40 to 50 quid, according to the Ed Price Index. So, let's open the box. When we first opened it, we were like blindfolded blind men in a dark room, looking for a board that wasn't really there. At first, there was a sheet of yellow paper saying, Read this first explaining the order in which you should read the contents and confirming that there is no board. Surely some mistake. First, you needed to read the basic role-playing booklet. Greg Stafford had distilled the essential percentile mechanics into a pamphlet that provided the essential rune rules for RuneQuest, which was later adopted by other KCM games, most notably Call of Cthulhu, which we'll explore in the next episode. The idea of a percentile dice being able to resolve most skill-based actions was fairly simple to grasp, as was the attribute versus attribute resistance table to resolve tests of strength, willpower and agility. Also in there, and next up, is the RuneQuest rulebook. The cover and the box featured an evocative painting by the wonderful Ian McCaig, depicting a woman in a boiled leather bikini, uh, battling against some horrible lizard monster. We would learn that the woman's chances of survival were minimal if the tenets of the rules were followed, but it was a homage to the uh, original American version by Louise Perrin. F also in there was Fangs, a collection of much-needed pre-generated player characters, non-player characters, should I say, the best thing about RuneQuest is that the NPCs are as richly detailed as the PCs. But the worst thing about RuneQuest is that you have to roll NPCs in the same way as the PCs. It meant much more work for the Games Master. 
And this booklet provided characters generated on one of those fancy computers that everyone was talking about. But the best thing in there was Apple Lane, a card-back booklet with a simple line drawing of a little fella being mugged by a goblin-like creature. Inside it provides the details of a small hamlet nestled in the mountains of Dragon Pass. There are three scenarios. The most significant is Gringle's Pawn Shop, where the adventurers are recruited to protect a building against an attack from a pack of baboons. We first played the game on a summer's day um, way back in 81. And it was actually Gringle's Pawn Shop. And as a games master, I played over the game a hundred times in my head before we actually sat down to do it. There had been weeks of painstaking preparation. The scenario suggested that the plans of the pawn shop that the player characters needed to def defend were mapped out on a, a piece of butcher paper. But I wasn't sure what butcher paper was, um, and neither was the bemused heavy metal loving guy at the Manchester Games Workshop when I asked him. So I compromised and I drew the floor pan of Gringo's pawn shop on a sheet of graph paper, and we used our collected Citadel minis as pieces. In essence, we created a board game for a game that didn't really need it. The first game was faltering as I was constantly consulting the rules to accommodate an action that the players had come up with that didn't fit into the version that I'd practised in my head. Despite the sometimes clumsy session, it was clear by the end of it that we were hooked, the thrill of being in the middle of an epic combat with a group of bandits led by a centaur was just too enticing, and the ability to determine our own destiny in a fantasy world when we were forced with such conformity in school made us more determined to learn the rules and put in the hours to get better and better at it. It's a pity that now, for shipping and tax reasons, most RPGs don't come in boxes. RuneQuest 6, the most recent edition, is a handsomely produced book. In my enthusiasm for it, I've bought a PDF copy, a softback copy, a Kindle version of Essential Rules, as well as a backup hard copy of the Essential Rules, which shows what red wine and the internet can do for you. But if it came in the box, just listen to the noise it could make. Hang on, let's see if we can do it. Whoa, it's fallen over. Let me put it here. Let's see if we can do it here, ready? Oh, listen to that. I've just had a I've just had one of those uh, Proustian rushes. I'll be alright in a bit. Oh. Section two The White Dwarf Everything comes back to White Dwarf. Back in the day, White Dwarf was quite different from the corporate brochure that it is today. It was a fanzine of sorts filled with miscellaneous articles, scenarios, reviews and comic strips. More importantly for us, it acted like a social media. There was a small ad section that we would scrutinise to find signs of gaming life beyond our small town. We even put an ad in it once, asking for more players. As a result, Eddie joined us, and he only lived in the next street. On Twitter, at Daily Dwarf has been posting carefully chosen pieces from the magazine's heyday, and I'm delighted to say that he's chosen some great pieces about RuneQuest for this podcast. So, in his own words, Dirk asked me to pick a particularly memorable RuneQuest article or scenario from the august pages of White Dwarf to discuss. A pleasure, but before I do... A little background. There were no RuneQuest articles or scenarios in the first few issues of White Dwarf I bought. That, however, didn't stop me from buying the KSCM 2nd edition box set. I saw it nestled on the shelves of my friendly local game shop, F.C. Parker in Cardiff, sadly long since gone. And the evocative box cover art from Louise Perrin was enough. The game instantly appealed to me. A rule system, not better or worse than D&D, just different. Combat was fast, crunchy and deadly. And while the spells like the pizzazz 
of those in D&D, I really like the magic system. Spending power points to cast spells made much more sense than the once cast, instantly forgotten mechanic of D&D. I'd yet to have read any Jack Vance. The other distinguishing feature of the game was, of course, Glorantha. The rulebook sketched out a little of Gloranthan history with tantalising talk of Dragon Pass, Sartar and the Lunar Empire. The maps too looked like they were going to be fun to explore. But overall, the main rulebook didn't offer much detail on Glorantha. That didn't really matter much to my gaming group at the time though. We had pawn shops to defend and rainbow mounds to explore. But then... Well, the first RuneQuest feature I remember reading in White Dwarf was actually a story. Oliver Dickinson's Lucky Eddie in issue 29. But it was really with the sequel in the next issue, G Griselda Gets Her Man, that I think my crisis of confidence with RuneQuest began. The story, while good fun, mentioned lots of characters, places and events I knew nothing about. The story and the new Rune Rights column that also started in issue 30 referenced features in Worm's footnotes which I'd never heard of before. And around this time, Chaosium went into overdrive, producing supplements covering Glorantha in detail. The cults, the tribes, the places. It seems daft saying it now, but at the time I felt like an obligation to get to grips with all this background material, because if I didn't, I wouldn't be playing RuneQuest properly. Unfortunately though, all these supplements were out of reach for a teenager with no disposable income. And so, for a year or two, I didn't play much RuneQuest. But with a system that good, it couldn't stay away forever. Rather than get overwhelmed with the details, I decided to start off my campaign small, with adventures set just around Pavis and the Big Rubble. Over time, and with the odd supplement as a birthday stroke Christmas present, I gained confidence to expand my campaign out into the wild world of Glorantha. And of course, I had the dawning of the realisation that it was my campaign, and if I went to bit off piste compared with the official Goranthan supplement, well, so what? Also, of great help in building my confidence with RuneQuest was the wealth of scenarios and articles published in White Dwarf. The idiosyncratic British slant was ever-present in the magazine, meshed in very well with Goranthan's slightly quirky and RuneQuest's slightly quirkier take on fantasy role-playing. Over the years, White Dwarf brought us many quality scenarios. Samurai, some properly disturbing demonic nobility, barbarians, an excursion to Takumel, the further adventures of Griselda, and rules for Elf Ball, not to mention Lots and lots of brew. So, after all that waffle, what did I choose? I decided to go all the way back to issue 14 and the scenario The Lair of the White Worm by John Bethel. Actually, I first encountered it in the Best of White Dwarf Scenarios, Volume 1 but I did later pick up issue 14 in my relentless pursuit of back issues on eBay. So why this scenario? On the face of it, the lair of the white worm could be described as a standard Zeus-style dungeon, typical of early white dwarf scenarios. 
it certainly lacks the more intricate plots and or exotic flavours of such later RuneQuest scenarios such as On the Road, issue 59, A Tale to Tell, issue 85, and When Mad God Laugh, issue 88. And yet, and yet, the scenario introduction layers rumour upon hearsay upon rumour. Nearby caves contain signs of a long abandoned dragon nuke colony. This colony is thought to have harboured a worm, injured escaping from a party of Morakans. Not only that, the worm is rumoured to have taken some valuable scrolls, one of which in particular the Morakans would pay well to recover. What adventure-seeking play character could resist? Two things are immediate clear. One, this can only be RuneQuest. The distinctive creatures of RuneQuest are one of its biggest strengths. Glorantha really comes alive when you consider the backgrounds, cultures and histories of its monsters. It's telling that Chaosium has never needed to publish endless monster compendiums for the game. A number of other monsters unique to RuneQuest are peppered around the complex, although I should notice that there's only one brew in this adventure. It's a little known fact that UK law required White Dwarf to feature at least one brew every RuneQuest scenario it published. And two. Despite its small scale, this adventure, it offers plenty of opportunities to expand the story to a wider campaign. That introduction raises many questions. What happened to the Dragon Newts? Why did they abandon the complex? Why had the Morakans imprisoned the worm? And just what is in that scroll that the Morakans want so badly? As a fledgling games master, I really appreciated this style of scenario. The adventure itself didn't overwhelm you with detail, but it provided plenty of hooks that you could develop later with the payoff, sometimes coming months or even years down the line. I always enjoyed this sort of extended storyline as a player, with new adventures building on clues uncovered during earlier escapades and so try to create such adventures as a games master. This scenario also provides a couple of NPCs that could be used with in ongoing adventures. One is Odil, a drunken dwarf who the party find hanging from a coat hook, and the other, Quincy the Barbarian Duck, master of Quack Fu. Ah yes, ducks. When I first encountered ducks in RuneQuest, I must admit that I was a little thrown. They did seem a bit out of place. Maybe that was due to my background in D&D and the fact that the illustrations in Judge's Guild scenarios at the time were blatant Daffy Duck rip-offs. However, it's surprising how quickly I came to accept them as just another part of the charm of RuneQuest. I always liked playing duck NPCs as slightly whimsical, tragic figures, rather than just for cheap laughs. The Lair of the White Worm isn't without its faults. It suffers in places from the typical zoo dungeon illogicality of why haven't the monsters in Room X robbed, fought, killed, eaten, made lampshades of the creatures in Room Y? just down the corridor variety. But with a bit of tweaking here and there, it can be turned into a much more believable dungeon. Overall, despite its rather modest size, this scenario I hold in great affection and was a stepping stone on my way to loving RuneQuest. Okay, so Dirk said I should pick one scenario or article but I'd also like to give a quick honourable mention to Rumble at the Tin Inn by Michael Cool from issue 33. It's a room quest bar room brawl 
an homage to Lewis Pulsifer's D&D barroom brawl from issue 11. And it's great fun for a one-off gaming session. So get the pizza and beers in, gather your mates and join the trolls Big R and Little R, among others, for a night of alcohol fuel violence at the best inn in Apple Lane. Actually, it's the only inn. Section 3. Judge Blythe Rules. So Judge Blythe is our resident rules lawyer and when everyone else is happy to wave something through, Blythe will insist on referring to the rules with the nominus, we could live or die by these. Uh, to be fair, it comes from a sense of consistency. Uh, if we agree something that's beneficial to the PCs, such as increased damage during combat, then we need to be certain that it's right when the damage is coming in the other direction. Okay, I've got him here. Welcome, Judge Blythe. Hello, Dirk. Hello there. So I've come all the way from Dirk Towers to your ivory tower uh, to talk about the request rules, uh, Judge Blythe. So for, first off, just give us a quick overview, because uh, you're a strong advocate of the percentile system. I do like the percentile system. I think it's a nice, simple system. Um, and it's also a system that kind of covers every eventuality. Uh, I think it's very adaptable. Um, and although a RuneQuest character sheet can uh, look a little bit daunting to people who, who are not familiar with role-playing games, I think once you get your head around that very, very simple percentile system, um, it does become very clear very quickly. Yeah, because I think the uh, thing is, is that in real life, not natural life, we use like percentages, don't we, to say... We do, yeah. I mean, you know, in, in ordinary life, you will hear people saying, you know, I think it's 50-50 or I think I'm, you know, 90% sure, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and that's true of RuneQuest. So it's very, uh, it's a very adaptable system as well. So as always happens in role-playing games, where the games master and the players have to come to some decision about something that's not uh, covered in the rules, uh, it, it's quite easy to come up with a percentage-based idea, either by multiplying a statistic by three or by five, um, or just coming up with some general percentage that seems reasonable. Yeah. Critics of um, RuneQuest rules and uh, the percentage system um, say that when you get to higher level characters or higher level NPCs that's where it comes a bit unstuck I think that's true to some extent um, it can be a little bit difficult when uh, you get a couple of characters uh, who are very very good with weapons you know and are like 90 or 100% with weapons um, it can become a bit tricky and you do get a sort of deadlock although I do think some of the rules uh, in RuneQuest Combat, which we might talk about later, do get around that to some extent. I mean, I think um, one, one of the advantages of having um, over 100% is this idea that you can fight multiple opponents yeah. and split your yeah. attacks. Um, but somehow that doesn't seem to cover it, does it? And, and, and also, there's like this impossibility. Um, and this, one of the discussions we often have around the table is, how does anybody get above... 100% because you, you, you've got to roll under 5 uh, to get the experience point in effect. That's true, it, it, it's, it's not too difficult to get to sort of 70% because in RuneQuest you can buy training as well, so you make experience rolls but you also buy training but once you get beyond 70 it's just experience rolls, uh, so it is tricky um, and I suppose it depends how often you play the game, uh, if you play fairly regularly there's a chance your character may get to those kind of levels um, but yeah it is quite difficult yeah. I think as well another another element to the rules is the defence rule so an opponent will have what's called a defence percentage which is based on ability to dodge um, and evade blows so even if your character is 100% with a broadsword you may meet an opponent who's got a 25% defence, so you're not always operating at your optimum level. True. Yeah. So when you come to uh, RuneQuest uh, 2, RuneQuest 2nd Edition, as we, we, we need to call it, um, I'm going to ask you this question every episode, right? Not about RuneQuest, but about every system that we talk about. Okay, what are the top three mechanics 
from your point of view? For me, the top three mechanics are in, in no particular order, <laughs> to use an X Factor phrase. Uh, the fumble rule, strike rank, and hit locations. So the fum, fumble rule, strike rank, and hit locations. So we'll talk, we'll talk about those. It's very interesting that they're all combat related. They are. I, I must admit, when you asked me the question, I was, uh, I was wondering about this. They are all combat related. I think the reason for that is that the combat system in RuneQuest is quite... Uh, I wouldn't say realistic. It is realistic to a point, but it's also quite colourful and, I think, as some people have said, cinematic in the way it operates. Um, I think that the other rules um, covering other activities, because it's all a percentile system, are all pretty much the same. So the rule that covers riding a horse, climbing a wall, swimming a river, because it's all percentile, it's the same rule, effectively. Yeah. There doesn't seem to be much difference in those rules. Yeah. So bending a bar, kicking in a door... It's all percentile based, so it's the same rule operating throughout the system. I think where you get the interesting mechanics are with the combat system. Yeah. So let's talk about those in um, a bit more uh, depth. So fumble rule. So what do you like about the fumble rule? How does it work? And why well, have you what, what I like about the fumble rule um, is the fact that uh, it does add incident to combat, and to some extent, it works against what we've just been talking about, where you get two very, very powerful characters fighting each other. Yeah. Um, and the fumble rule is simply that if you roll uh, to hit or to parry a blow and you roll 96 to 100, uh, you have to roll on what's called a fumble table, which will indicate that you know, you drop your weapon, um, an armor strap breaks, you, uh, at its worst you hit, hit a friend with your sword by mistake or even hit yourself. And I think that adds a lot of colour to yeah. combat. You know, no, none of us like rolling a fumble, no. but there's many a time when we've been up against a, a big, nasty, dangerous opponent and the opponent has fumbled, and that's been the way in and the way to kind of defeat them. And I think as well, it adds an element of realism. You know, if you're in a fight, you might drop your weapon. Yeah. You know, you might, your shield strap might break, and that, you know... It, it challenges you to think a bit more tactically because you're not just guaranteed success. You know, things can go wrong. Yeah, and I think uh, most of the um, comic um, time that we've had around the table has been as a result of a fumble. I have severed my own arm. Yeah, <laughs> quite, <laughs> recently. Have, have, quite recently. Quite yeah. recently, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In a terrible battle axe accident. Yeah, and that, that'll teach you to pick your nose. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So the, uh, the the next uh, the next mechanic you've uh, chosen is the strike rank rule. Now, what's interesting about the strike rank rule before you explain it is the strike rank rule is a preserve of the second edition rules. Mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, um, the strike rank rule has been adapted and changed in subsequent editions to be something quite different than it is mm -hmm. in the. Um, in, in the second edition so I'm, I'll leave you to describe it <laughs> um, and explain how it works um, and I'd, I'd be interested to know why you think it has uh, has changed well the, to just to explain it uh, for those who don't know the strike rank rule is uh, a number that each character has in combat based on their size their dexterity and the type of weapon they're using which indicates the order in which they strike in combat. So yeah. uh, a quick character um, has an advantageous strike rank because they're quick. A big character has an advantageous strike rank because they've got more reach. Uh, and certain weapons have a better strike rank. So, for example, um, a big, quick character with a spear has a much better strike rank than a slow, small character with a dagger. Yeah. Um, for the obvious reason that, you know, a spear has got more reach. So if you've got a spear, you're going to get a stab at the guy with the dagger before he gets near you. Yeah. Um, I like that because I think it's quite realistic in the sense that if you watch or read anything about uh, hand-to-hand combat medieval weapons, you do find that those are realistic elements. So having a spear 
in, in, uh, unless you're in a confined space. Having a spear is a good weapon. It stops people getting near you. That you can get in first. Yeah. Um, I think as well, it's good in that it avoids uh, a problem with many role-playing games. Perhaps not now, but at the time RuneQuest Second Edition was published, where people just simply rolled for initiative. So there was this problem of who goes first, and you just roll in a dice, yeah, um, and that decides, which seemed a little bit, a um, little bit silly. Whereas Strike Rank does make a genuine attempt to simulate what would happen in a real fight and who would go first and why they would go first. I think the other thing that it also determines is the amount of actions you're having a, a round as well. So there's yeah, kind yeah, of a, you know, the faster that you are, the more you can do in a round yeah. and, 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 and that kind of thing. Yeah, a good, good example of that is um, uh, missile weapons. So if you've got a good strike rank and you're quick, you can perhaps get two shots in, whereas someone else might only get one shot in. Yeah. So why do you think why do you think subsequent editions have changed that or adapted it? Because I actually think in the later editions, yeah, they actually deal with the issue of weapon length and uh, uh, this issue of um, when you strike and how many actions you have in, in, in a round a lot better. So RuneQuest Six, for example, is is better than Strike Rank. Because I, I remember back in the day, we would uh, argue about strike rank and the whole idea of simultaneous hits and all that kind of thing and how that would work. And I think the nuances kind of mm. uh, have been unpicked a little bit with the other things. I suppose it, it, one of the difficulties with strike rank in second edition is, is a little bit like the problem we touched on earlier with, with characters who've got good percentage scores in that there's a sort of deadlock about it so one of the difficulties is it's inevitable that if uh, you've got a really good strike rank and the opponent hasn't you're always going first you're always going first every single time in combat whereas in combat it wouldn't quite be like that you'd have the edge but you know the guy with the spear's got the edge over the guy with the dagger but if the guy with the dagger is clever quick as a lucky break, then he might get in first. And I suppose later traditions try to accommodate that. So yeah. they give they Absolutely. give certain characters an edge in terms of going first, based on size, dexterity, weapon. But it also accommodates a little bit of unpredictability, yeah. which is no bad thing, really. Yeah. Okay, and uh, third on your, uh, your, your list is the hit locations rule. So what's that and how does that work? Well... Hit locations. Um, I, I know, by the way. I'm just, you, you know, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is just in case there's any doubt. Yeah, <laughs> he's not an idiot. He doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. Although some of the games is games master. <laughs> I have one. Yeah. Um, hit locations is is really just as the name suggests that uh, when you hit with a weapon, uh, you don't parry. The weapon gets through. Um, it hits part of your body. It hits. Uh, you roll a d twenty. It's going to hit your head, your chest, your abdomen one left right arm, left right leg, um, and the effect of the damage uh, is going to be relevant to the bit of the body that it hits. So yeah. take a nasty wound to your leg, you're on the floor, take a nasty wound to your arm, you might drop your weapon, um, take a nasty wound to your head or your chest, you might be unconscious. Um, so it accommodates the notion that when you're hit, you're not just losing hit points, you're being hit somewhere and where you hit has a consequence in combat. I think, um, and again, it's not a unique thing to RuneQuest, but at the time, I think it was fairly innovative. Um, and we would often joke that, you know, uh, a 10th level fighter in D&D, &D, uh, second, first, second edition D&D, &D, can end up on two hit points after a particularly nasty fight and still manages to run away. Yeah. Whereas in reality, if you've taken a bit of a battering, you're probably going to be on the floor uh, and in considerable pain. Um, and I think the hit locations rule is good for that, in that, you know, you take a blow to the leg, yeah. you're on the floor. You can't run away. And it's the it's the hit location rule and uh, that makes uh, RuneQuest so deadly. I, I, mm. put it, I put it to you. Uh, I think you're right. It does. It, not, yeah. not in the sense that it may not, that wound to your leg may not kill you, yeah. but it may put you in a position where your chances of survival are limited yeah. because the opponent is now above you, coming bearing down on you and gets advantages for that. You can't run away unless you can heal yourself. You, you, you're stuck there. Uh, 
so so I often give the example of uh, we, we played with a D&D player um, he went rushing <laughs> towards uh, Trollkin assuming that there were one hit dice monsters mm. he rushed into uh, 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 to, to confront them they hit him with a sling and shattered his kneecap and he was on the deck um, within the first uh, first strike rank I think exactly. he was and the rest of us who were experienced RuneQuest players didn't pursue him to help him because we knew the same fate would befall us <laughs> <laughs> so much for cooperative gaming yeah. the rest of the RuneQuest players were up in the trees hiding from the talking but yeah <laughs> but yeah that's a, that a hit location I think I think where hit locations get um, a little tortuous and a little uh, difficult is on some of the creatures that you encounter. Mm. So you, I, I'm sure that part of the joke built into uh, RuneQuest 2 uh, is the Walktopus. Now, Walktopus <laughs> is a uh, walking uh, humanoid octopus. And so the hit location uh, is just a case of rolling on it. Oh, you've hit another tentacle. Uh, yep, yep, oh, yeah. Yeah, you hit another tentacle, uh, and so it goes on. So I'm, I'm sure that, um, that, that, that that's why they had uh, Waterbus, so that they could just stretch the limits of hit locations. I think that's true. That's true scorpion men as well. Yeah. The six legs, uh, the tail of a scorpion man that you just chop another leg off. It's like yeah. pulling, pulling the legs off uh, Daddy Long Legs, isn't it? Yeah. And nothing never dies. It just loses limbs. And I think, I think that is a strength, actually, in RuneQuest 6. Um that in request six, if your limb takes a nasty amount of damage, it's not just a case if you can't use it. You have to make endurance rolls to uh, stay conscious. Because um, I do think that is a little bit of a failing in request two, that whilst it has hit locations, arms and legs really just incapacitate arms and legs. Whereas if, if your arm was cut off, you would clearly in real life you're going to shock. Yes. You wouldn't be able to carry on fighting with one arm. You know, you wouldn't be yeah. like the uh, the Black Knight in uh, Monty Python, the Holy Grail, and just claim it as a scratch. Yes. Um, and I think we're all we're often guilty of when a load of damage is coming towards you, keeping your fingers crossed and thinking, well, I hope it's a leg yeah. and an arm because I can heal that and sort myself out. Whereas it was my head, I'm a goner. Yeah. But in in reality, to lose a limb would be quite. Traumatic, and yeah. I think RuneQuest Six, the later editions of RuneQuest, do deal with that a little bit better. But the, the hit locations is a, is a good starting point, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and going to take yourself back in the day. Okay. What are the uh, rules that um, uh, that that you think could be done better? See me uh, do better with this. Uh, Mr. Perry, what do you think? What, what, what do you think could be better? <laughs> I think I think a classic rule in RuneQuest Two that could be better is spirit combat. Right. Yeah. Um, spirit combat is uh, tricky to explain, but the idea that you are, I suppose, in a way, it's a bit for for D and D player, it's a bit like being attacked by a ghost or a, or a ghoul or something, isn't it? Whereas yeah. the combat isn't physical combat; it's sort of. Uh, Souls competing but, against each other. Yeah, and I've mentioned I've mentioned uh, power points. So power points is uh, your spirit, your magical um, uh, ability, your elan, if you want to mm. use that, um, uh, and, and sort of life. And really, what what uh, spirit combat does is pit somebody else's power against your power in a resistance role, which is converted into a percentage. So, um, if I've got ten power and you've got ten power. Uh, then it's 50-50 chance. And the difficulty with uh, spirit combat is that once the uh, once it goes one way, it, there's no way out of it. Yeah, it becomes it becomes uh, a strange combination of uh, terrifying and tedious. In that, it becomes quite boring, and there's no way out of it. So once, as you say, once it starts to not go your way. Uh, you, you start to lose, you kind of know you're going to lose, uh, in the same way that if it goes the opposition's, if it goes your way, the opposition is in a similar position. It can become a little bit tedious, and it seems a little bit ill-conceived, yeah. uh, particularly given that the, the, the physical combat rules are so innovative and colourful, but spirit combat, so combat against ghosts and things like that, 
is so pedestrian, really, I think. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, a problem uh, to some extent with all of the magic in RuneQuest, mm -hmm. is that it does seem mechanical and pedestrian. And it is something that does get addressed uh, in later editions. But because everybody's got magic, it becomes a bit matter of fact um, uh, and mechanical. I'm very surprised, though. I'm very surprised that you haven't chosen uh, what I thought you would have chosen, right? as, your, as your number one thing. Because I know that when we're around the table, uh, the thing that gets kicked around the table uh, and then onto the floor and covered in fluff is the idea of special attacks and yes. uh, critical attacks. Yes, that's true. That is a problem. Yeah. I, I think your eyebrows have almost come off your head at times about critical hits, yeah? And ignoring armour and <laughs> the, the difference between impales. So just what, what's, your, what's your problem with uh, critical hits? Judge Blythe. I don't have a problem with the concept of a critical hit. But I do have a bit of a problem the way it's played out in RuneQuest 2. Um, yeah. I can remember even back in the day when we were younger, it was an endless source of confusion and, uh, uh, and debate. I think the problem for that is when you uh, two type of special attack in RuneQuest, there's a critical, um, which is 5% uh, of your base chance, um, and an impale or a slash or a crush, depending on the type of weapon. Um, which is 20%. So the problem is, um, for me, that a critical ignores the opponent's armour. Yeah. Or, in the case of unarmoured opponents, it does double damage. But generally speaking, in most combats, it's ignoring the armour. An impale, on the other hand, does full damage plus roll damage. So, example, you've got an opponent with two points leather armour. A critical with a uh, composite bow does 1d8 damage plus 1 ignores armour you could roll a 3 and it ignores his armour it isn't that bad no. an impale on the other hand against the same target does 9 damage maximum damage plus roll damage so you could do a hell of a lot of damage the fact he's got 2 point leather armour is neither here nor there <laughs> Yeah. He's a goner. So it seems to me there's actually more chance of doing something quite deadly and less chance of doing something that should be more deadly, but somehow, predominantly, in yeah. most situations, isn't that deadly. Yeah. And I think back in the day we often got confused about criticals and impales and we, I think at one point we used to have a critical impale, which was both an impale and a critical uh, and I think that was the reason that it never quite stacked up. Yeah. In most situations, it was far better to do an impale. And I, I think I, I do think I'm right in saying that Oliver Dickinson in uh, White Dwarf um, offered that as a solution to mm. uh, these endless yeah. debates. And in later editions, it does get resolved. Um, it does. It, does. Done, it's it was, it was all, always a bone of contention. I yeah. Um, before we move on. Uh, I, I have to. If I had to choose one rule that I think is is brilliant in uh, in request two, and it's only a little thing, it's only a little bit of colour, and that's the uh, chaotic features table, uh, yeah. because the wonderful thing about uh, Rune Quest is the Galanthan monsters, and the chaotic creatures especially are really good. So your scorpion men, uh, octopus, uh, bruise. But what makes them extra special is that you can roll on a table, and on that table can give them a chaotic feature. So there's nothing better than the thought. Uh, well, not I'm, I'm a games master, as you can tell. There's nothing better than the thought that, that when you're fighting a brew, that it might explode on death. Yeah, or can breathe fire. Yeah, some unexpected kind of element to the monster, so you're never quite guaranteed. Um, and I think that highlights, to some extent, one of the beauties of RuneQuest. Um, and again, to draw on our D&D friend who played RuneQuest for the first time, he was often guilty. And, and I say that's, this with a caveat that I know there are later editions of D&D that are more sophisticated. This is kind of first, second edition D&D. He would often have the view that he could suss out his chances. So if he was a seventh level paladin and he was fighting four orcs, he knew there were one-hit dice monsters they'd have no chance of hitting him, he'd have a very good chance of hitting them, 
and one hit would probably clean clean them out and get rid of them. Yeah. The beauty of RuneQuest is that you're never quite sure what you're getting into. So chaotic feature, uh, yeah, that's a, a puny brew. It looks kind of you know weedy. Um, I'm going to beat it. Hang on a minute, it can breathe fire, and when it dies, it explodes. Yeah. You're not quite sure. Same with the Trollkin. Trollkin, like a, for those who don't know, like a little goblin kind of character. But if it's 100% with its short sword, yeah. you're only 25% with your great axe, you're the one that's in trouble. Yeah. And there's no way of telling that until you're in combat. So there's, yeah. a, big, I think there's a big unpredictability about RuneQuest, which, which makes it yeah. enjoyable and risky and exciting. Yeah. So that's, that's the rules. Now, we've had a special request here um, to debate one uh, issue on, uh, on RuneQuest. Um, that separates us, it divides us. Um, it, I wouldn't say it's the same schism as early, late Genesis um, that divides us, but um, we need to talk about ducks. Is this the issue that divides the ducks from the geese? It is. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> So well, I like I like the ducks in RuneQuest. Yeah, no, I do. Yeah, I played the odd duck. Yeah, whereas I couldn't give a duck about ducks. I think they daft, and <laughs> no amount of convincing, no amount of uh, you know adaptation. I'm thinking the later mongoose um, um, supplements. Ducks appeared as kind of buff humanoids with feathers. Um, but I, I remember the Judge's Guild version that looked like Donald Duck. It looked a bit like Donald, yeah. yeah. That's true. Or Daffy. Yeah. Or, um, or Howard. Or Howard. <laughs> or Huey Lee and Dewey. Yeah. Um, Scrooge, yeah, I can Scrooge see. Man. I can see. I can see why um, people would consider them a bit silly. But I do think it's testament to Greg Stafford that he incorporated these strange creatures and the explanation is, you know, that they are either men that the gods cursed to be like ducks or ducks that the gods cursed to be like men. Yeah, I think is a nice explanation for something that seems a bit silly and sort of works. For me, it sort of works. Yeah. You know, and I think it's, you know, well done, Greg, <laughs> for pulling that off. The, the issue I've got with ducks, uh, I've got several issues with ducks, but... That's for a different podcast. But um, that, the problem I've got with ducks is that, first of all, I just can't imagine them having a conversation with a duck, right? I don't imagine uh, how it can articulate and uh, discuss things. But put that aside for a minute. I think you have to put that aside in a fantasy game. I mean, that, that would be true right. of a number of... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a number of absolutely. monsters, wouldn't it? Absolutely. It, it, it shows the limits of my imagination. It does, it does. It shows the limits of my imagination. So I accept that. I put that to one side. But what I put to you, Mr. Judge Blyther, is that as soon as a duck appears on the scene, everybody thinks it's a free-for-all to start making jokes about orange sauce, um, pancakes, pancake. Uh, uh, it, yeah. It, you know... 30-odd years of playing has not diminished the amount of hilarity, puns, uh, can I see the bill? Um, that, that, the amount of puns that are generated by putting a duck into your adventure. Nobody takes them seriously. Now, you might say you like them, and you can say, oh, Greg Stafford had a brilliant vision of all this, but you, you can't resist it. If I put if I put it on the if I put a duck in the story, that duck is going to have. Uh, I think that, that's true. I think you're the, right there. But what you have to consider is let's look at the things we've just discussed about RuneQuest. Yeah. We're talking limbs flying off left, it, right, and centre. We're yeah. talking fumbles where people stab the people on their own side. Uh, all sorts of horror and bloodshed. So a bit of a laugh every now and again is no bad thing. Uh, we remain divided. This house remains divided. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Judge Blyther, you don't have the ultimate jurisdiction on that. So um, thank you very much. And until next time, goodbye. Goodbye. Section 4, the Games Master screen. I'm a grognard Games Master. And I have a table for everything. And I'm going to roll on my specially chosen dice in my cursed dice cup 
and select five RuneQuest supplements for discussion. I've been given the pricing information from Ed's Bargain Shed so you'll know the current market rate at auction so you can recreate the grognard experience in the comfort of your own shed. OK, first up, I've rolled a 56. The Cults of Terror. It's the kind of book that's likely to get you on some terrorist most wanted list these days. It certainly frightened the wits out of my parents when I used my Auntie Susan's collection of freshly minted 20p coins to buy this supplement as a Christmas present. Heads turned on Christmas morning as it was unwrapped and my mum and dad expected my head to turn and start spewing mushy peas. There are two p books that were produced with the details of Cults of Glorantha. The Cults of Prax supplement was really good for players as it gave a sense of their characters. By choosing a particular cult, it allowed a degree of characterisation. If a player was Stormbull, they were chaos-hating berserker barbarians. If they were Humact, they were paladin-like warriors with a lawful sense of purpose. The progression through the cult was also an incentive for character development. Characters began their adventuring career as lay members of their cult, and after a number of enough time and a number of adventures and contribution to the cultural organisation, adventurers in RuneQuest 2 were striving towards personal improvement so they could become participants in the Hero Wars. In all of our time of playing, only two characters ever made it past the rigorous threshold and became Rune Lords. I was a games master for RuneQuest when we first started playing, and I hated Cults of Prax. Like Daily Dwarf said, I was completely overwhelmed by it all. The hundreds of names, the gods, the various planes, the various eras and contradictory stories. As a games master, I felt I needed to know it all to be effective. I know that many people are turned on by all the various myths and uh, I like the concept of Galantha, but I wasn't drawn into the esoteric details. For example, Oka, also known as the Yellow Hand of the Great, who was also known as the Orphan Maker, turned himself into a badger to escape the Great Second Reckoning because his father had become an otter in the First Great Reckoning. As a consequence of their actions, all the badgers and otters are in a great war with each other and are enemies of the trolls. But I'm making this up, it's not really in Cults of Prax, but it might as well be. When I was 14, endless pages of this kind of guff was, to use one of Ed's phrases, as dry as a pharaoh's sock. Cults of Terror, on the other hand, was more accessible and interesting. Nine dangerous deities for the cruel and unusual. As a games master, they're great for populating and devising scenarios because it gave the bad guys motivations. Rather than being simply evil, there were methods and reasons why the Bruce and Scorpion men all behave in a way that they do. And they need to do it to fulfil their cultural position. The cover by Paul Jacques, who was a prolific contributor to RuneQuest 2 supplements, is one of the best of any role-playing supplement, as it depicts an adventuring party interrupting and ritual summoning of some diabolical spirit by a group of brew. It also contains one of the most feared cults from our campaigns back in the day, Thanatar, the severed god, whose devotees seek the heads of their enemies using their cult weapon, the Garot. The mere mention of this sends a shiver down our spines. The cult books come up on eBay fairly frequently and you can expect to pay between £20 and £30 for a copy of either Cults of Prax or Terror. The Moon Design Compendium is more difficult to get hold of and it goes for over £50. But it also has additional cults from other supplements such as Troll Pack. 
Okay. Next roll. 33. Griffin Mountain. Unlike other KCM campaign supplements, this wasn't a box set. It was a single volume packed to the brim with maps, encounters, colourful NPCs and lots and lots of adventure hooks. To the north of Prax there is Balazar, a region previously occupied by giants who built citadels which remain the power bases of the region. The Lunars have a fragile hold over the area that's richly populated by the elder races such as the Aldramai, the Trolls and lots and lots of chaotic creatures. In the mid-80s, the Armchair Adventurers Club expanded. There were up to six players around the table. Alan Herbert games mastered the Griffin Mountain campaign with an effortless air of someone making it up as he went along. The Griffin Mountain supplement suited him perfectly as he was completely open and allowed interactions with the characters that are imaginatively drawn and allow for significant intervention by the games master. One evening, Alan overplayed his hand. At one time, when the pace of the evening was dropping, while acting as cell swords working for Joe Myth, we came across a strange citadel on the horizon. As we approached, Alan reached into his bag, scrambled around for a bit before pulling out a Zodani spaceship plan from Traveller. Our barbarians spent a confusing couple of hours wandering around a spacecraft trying to make sense of the staterooms and gathering armfuls of power storage crystals. Fast forward to the present day and new characters are roaming through the plains of Balazar. They have recovered an ancient Stormbull artefact from the sinkholes from that other classic adventure pack, the Hell Pits of Nightfang. Our player characters have an association with the Lankar Mai scholar Bluebird and have destroyed the caravan of the ogre Gondor Holst. Great stuff. On eBay, the original booklet comes up now and again and usually goes for about £40. Avalon Hill did a box set version, but not set in Glorantha. Griffin Island is a pale shadow of the original. Games Workshop did a version of Griffin Island with a striking cover featuring a griffin in mid-flight. There are loads of them on eBay, so you can expect to get that for about £10 to £15. Pounds. But if you want to experience the quality, then seek out the original KC in publication. OK, next one. 97. 97. Let me just check. Let me make sure. Yes. Yes, it's a fumble. Quest World. KSEM produced Quest World in 1982. I got it for a birthday present in 1984. Following much research and fevered anticipation, thanks to the coverage it was given in White Dwarf and Different Worlds, the KSEM House magazine. KSEM wanted to capitalise on the growing portfolio of games using the basic role-playing system. However, the Swords and Sorcery games were indelibly tied to their setting. Stormbringer with the Young Kingdoms and RuneQuest with Glorantha. Greg Stafford wanted to maintain strict control over the content produced for Glorantha, which was causing frustration for licensing the game to other developers and to fans who wanted to produce homebrew material and contribute to the game world in publications. In the early days, non-Glorantha material was branded as Gateway, so that companies such as Judges Guild produced scenarios using creatures and cults from Glorantha, but in a non-specific location. Quest World was a lavish Gateway box set in the familiar KSEM style. Quest World is an alternate RuneQuest universe. There was an introduction to the world, mainly detailing the global weather conditions, which are a bit like Earth, so much like Earth that it's 
not really worth the amount of attention it's given. The world is not given a name, but the authors have created a map of the continent of Canos, which is provided in a wonderful fold-out map. They had the idea that other areas of the world would be developed by players, and there's a call to arms and a submissions guideline provided. Other games designers and companies were urged to contribute. Games Workshop were enthusiastic and commissioned some of their big hitters to work on developing supplements. Dave Morris has pu published some of his draft material in his Fable Lands blog. Much of it found its way into the Dragon Lords game that he produced because Quest World turned out to be a damp squib. It was so disappointing. Like Daily Dwarf, I was stifled by the overwhelming number of supplements that were being produced for Glorantha. Quest World looked like a way out. Thanks to its promise of being completely open and relaxed about what you did with the world, I was looking forward to letting rip shifting away from the ancient world to a more medieval setting, familiar, uh, something similar like Greyhawk. It didn't take me long to realise that the supplement wasn't going to live up to my expectations. Why doesn't it work? Well, first of all, the map doesn't spark any excitement for one thing. The names of the places are boring and there's nothing to grab the attention and get the creative juices flowing. Included in the box set are three booklets containing scenarios set in and around Greenwald. The scenarios were authored by different contributors so other than geography there's nothing to connect them. Candlefire is an attempt to create a hamlet in the style of Apple Lane, borrowing some of the elements, with some associated cults. The god of Panache, for example, is the god of Joie de Vie, followed by fops and dandies, with a useless rune spell that provide an air of confidence, etc. There's a casino in town too. It was one of the first games I played with new players following the ad in White Dwarf. They were bemused and unimpressed by it all. They weren't particularly interested in playing on a sloth one-armed bandit. They wanted to go and kill things. The other booklets, Greenwald Tales and Lord Skypen's Mansion, didn't help much either. They revealed an odd lightness of touch with a forced humour that didn't sit well with our style of play. Skypen's Mansion is an old-fashioned dungeon crawl with vampires and mutants where the player characters encounter Wally, the gargoyle cook. Greenwald's Tales are a series of one-shot adventures with different patrons, also featuring a contribution from Greg Stafford that we played, where the enemies are, the, are a group of chimpanzees who attack the players with darts. It wasn't just the lightness that seemed misplaced. It was the appearance of Glorantha characters and cults that seemed out of place too. Thanks to a deal struck in the Great Compromise, blah, 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 the same gods and creatures appeared in Quest World as appearing in Glorantha. However, some of the ecology of the creatures and features of the cults are inextricably linked with Glorantha. In the end, a Jacobar appearing in Quest World was a bit like when the Amazing Randy appeared in Happy Days. It was okay, but somehow it shouldn't be there, and it doesn't quite work. Quest World was soon abandoned, and I lent it to someone and never got it back. I returned to Glorantha and later designed my own Rune Quest World. If you want a copy of Quest World now, it'll cost about 40 quid. So think about that for a moment, whoever I lent it to. OK, next roll. 87.
The RuneQuest Companion. This slim volume was one of the later supplements for RuneQuest 2, produced before the third edition came out. In Bolton, amongst us role players, it acted as a kind of currency. It changed hands so many times, I think we all owned it at one point. Everyone. It was swapped for guitars, a Golden Heroes RPG, a pair of pirate book boots. Honestly, a pair of pirate boots. The Companion was a collection of articles from Wyrum's footnotes, or if you insist, Worm's footnotes, and different worlds. On the whole, it was a bit patchy. There are rules about Skullbush, a type of plant found on the plains of Prax. There's an interesting article about unicorns. There's additional Garantha material, including the first published material about the land south of Dragon Pass, showing Nochet and Casino. However, it's the short story that provided inspiration for one of our most enduring and memorable campaigns. The Smell of a Rat was a story about Zero, a detective, which really brought the setting of Glorantha alive. I blew my birthday money on Questworld. What I should have really invested in was Pavis. I've since learnt that this is more accurately pronounced Pavis, but I've always used the long vowel sound because I assumed that it was related to pavement, which is the British name for sidewalk. Pavis is a city on the edge of the plains of Prax, more accurately named New Pavis, a shadow of a former city which is now in ruins. KSEM produced the Big Rubble, a companion piece to Pavis. Because I couldn't afford it, I took inspiration from the smell of a rat and the Griselda stories by Oliver Dickinson in The White Dwarf, and I built Pavis myself. Gimpy's Tavern and Everything. The player characters were like all my detectives, solving crimes in the city. Hemlock Shirls and his assistant, Nadoldus Duck, investigated a jewel store that had been broken into from the inside. A hole in the wall leaving no rubble. A crime committed by Trollkin, who had smuggled themselves in and eaten the way out. They uncovered a great weapon-running operation masterminded by a disaffected Luna. That's why the Companion will always hold a special place, even though in retrospect it was a bit patchy. As for Pavis and the Big Rubble, I never had them back in the day. I couldn't afford it. But in the late 90s, I stumbled across the Moon Design reissue in a game shop in York. I bought it. It was the late 90s, I was a 50 quid man, with disposable income to spend on something I may never play. It was a nostalgic purchase. An investment too, because the copies of the Glorantha Classic version of Pavis, the Big Rubble, are going for over 70 quid. As for the RuneQuest Companion, it rarely turns up, and when it does, it can go between 30 and £40. Pounds. It isn't really worth that. But if you can get hold of the story Smell of Rat by fair means or foul, I recommend it. And the Griselda stories from White Dwarf too. They've been compiled in a volume that's widely available for about 15 quid. OK, next roll. Whoa, two. That's a critical. Borderlands. The gold standard. The benchmark Mention Borderlands to any RuneQuest player worth their salt and they'll say that this is the grand fromage of KSM's productions from back in the day. All other supplements need to be measured against this landmark campaign pack. One of the definitions of nostalgia is a homecoming. It certainly felt like that in 2013 when Judge Blythe got his hands on the Borderlands campaign pack. It's quite pricey on eBay, commanding prices of between £50 and £100. He found a copy on the American site Noble Knight Games and went for it. 
Set in the south of the River of Cradles, Duke Ross of Rhone, a lunar noble who has been exiled to the region with the aim of taming the lands ready for future settlers, employs the player characters. The nomad tribes have been pushed east and there remains an uneasy tension as the remaining tribes are in a power struggle. They all feel differently about the situation. Some are happy to cooperate and collaborate with the imperial power, while others are indifferent and others openly hostile. The campaign pack provides a referee book, a collection of brilliant encounters featuring some great characters with individual motivations and attitudes towards Ross of Roan. But the best feature is the pamphlets containing seven scenarios that make up the episodes within the campaign. We've been here before. There was a sense of deja vu returning after 30 years. I games mastered it in the early days of learning the RuneQuest rules. It contained everything that our 13-year-old minds needed to get immersed in the world of Glorantha. There was more detail about feral brews who would mate with beasts to create foul hybrids and the ecology of the Moracanth was explained, uh, bear-like creatures with heads of a tapir who herd human beings on the plains of Prax because they lost a wager with the gods when the mounted beasts were di divvied up. The player characters are recruited by the Duke to enforce his discipline on the wilderness. Adventures involve rooting out blooming duck bandits, clearing out a nest of foul brew, rescuing his daughter, clearing out a temple, there's loads of excitement in the adventures. This time round, we actually killed a dream dragon known as Karang, thanks to manticore poison and a crack shot. When we were younger, I was a stickler for rolling new characters from scratch every time one was killed. I didn't really appreciate how deadly these adventures were. Thankfully, this time round, we were quite a bit tougher and more skillful. By far the best element of the campaign is the interactions with the characters defined in the Encounters book and the members of Duke's household. There are rival mercenaries to contend with as well as ambitious tribal leaders. Essentially, as player characters, we are sellswords bound ridiculously to an austere contract that insists that all of the spoils of the adventures are handed over to the Duke under the threat of death. No player is going to live up to those terms, even those with a humact geese that forbids them to tell lies. So there's lots of fun to be had trying to get one over on the employer. Running into temples, clearing out newtlings was tremendous fun when we were 13, in the gung-ho 80s. In the 21st century, as a 40-somethings, we were racked with post-colonial guilt. We were uneasy about being a death squad, acting on the whim of an imperial power, inflicting genocide. The celebrated Five Eyes Temple scenario, the largest of the seven, a good old-fashioned dungeon crawl, is an act of ethnic cleansing on an epic scale. We felt guilty about it. We still did it though and had great fun in the process. Even if you never play Borderlands, try and get a hold of it, it's a great read. Well, that's the final roll on the table. Of course, you don't really know if I've been rolling a dice at all. Or even if there's a table. That's the beauty of the Games Master screen. And next time, it will be temporarily changed to a Keeper's screen. When I may or may not roll a dice on a table that might or might not be there for the magnificent world of Call of Cthulhu. Section 5! There is no Section 5! So that's the end of the first Grognard file. RuneQuest was always going to be a biggie. I'm sure that we'll come back to it later to look at some of those great supplements from the 90s. Thanks for putting up with my nasal drawl for so long. I hope it was worth it. But for now, I'll close up this file and put it back on the shelf. I'd love to hear about your experience of playing the game and I promise to share them in the next episode. So if you've ever played RuneQuest... I just want to give some feedback on the episode, then please contact me, Dirk the Dice. I'm on Twitter as at the Grognard File, or you can email on Dirk the Dice at gmail.com, or you can comment on the blog. 
armchairadventurerblog.com. Leave us feedback and give us five stars on iTunes too, because it matters a lot, I hear. I'd love to hear from you. I'm desperate to meet other gamers as much now as I was back then when I put a small lad in White Dwarf. Make sure you follow at Daily Dwarf too. There's more from him next time when we'll be opening the file on Call of Cthulhu. Until then, this is the end of the Grognard Files. <laughs>